there's anything you need to know about Henry Kissinger is that he is a player, even at the age of 93, and wants to be a player. One other thing that motivates him is his relentless desire to convince you that he's right, that his record properly understood is that he behaved well and he defended American interests well and he was not responsible for the perfidious things that his critics claim he's responsible for. Hello world, you're listening to Strategicon, your window to all things security and foreign affairs. It is Thursday, November 17, 2016, episode 19. For today's topic, we'll be joined by Strategicon co-host and SIA's resident existentialist philosopher, David Olney. Hello, David. Good afternoon, John. Before we get started on today's episode, I would like to remind listeners that Strategicon can be found on iTunes, SoundCloud, as well as a link to our podcast on the Sage International Australia website, www.sageinternational.org.au. Today's episode will be looking at a different aspect of the whole, oh my God, Trump won moment, that seems to be dominating the international news cycle. Yes, for those in our audience who have been hiding out in the cave, Donald J. Trump has won the US federal election of 2016. His victory ushers in a new age for America. What that will be is still anyone's guess because the authentic Trump has yet to reveal himself on the world stage. But judging from the outlandish rhetoric used by him in the lead up to the polls being called, we might be in for a wild ride come the day after Inauguration Day. When researching for this episode, I came across a very interesting article written by Jeffrey Goldberg in the December edition of The Atlantic. In it, he interviewed the doyen, no, the godfather of modern American foreign policy, Henry Kissinger. Now 93, Kissinger has had some very interesting things to say about the direction of US foreign policy under Obama. He also lightly touched on Trump. We'll use this interview as our jump-off point. David. During Henry Kissinger's critique of the Obama years, he mentioned that the contemporary United States is a key problem in that it has moved away from the country's core values, among them the concept of American exceptionalism. Kissinger asserted that America has been too indulgent in challenging what used to be core national beliefs. Has eight years of Obama made America look less special in the eyes of the world? Could America look any less special than it did on the last day of George Jr.? Well, I should say Bush Jr. Everyone knows who Bush Jr. is. Look, in reality, the Kissinger interview seems to cover a lot of things, and the exceptional idea is viewed from multiple perspectives. One seems to be there is the original version of exceptionalism as the beacon on the hill. Then there is the post-World War II exceptionalism of America should be the global arbiter of better behavior. Then we have Kissinger coming in with Nixon and saying, but it's got to be about American interest. Then we have Kissinger criticizing Obama and saying, but Obama didn't seem to know what American interest was and kept apologizing for things that Americans had done. So which version of exceptionalism would you like to start with? Oh, the one that says that America is Globocop and has a duty to defend planet Earth against all bad guys? That one. Yeah, that one. So what we want is men in black but without Obama because he'll be gone soon. So we don't have the heroic Will Smith character. Yeah, no, no, we don't have him. Instead, we have the grumpy old agent who we don't know what he believes or means in Trump. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right. Yes. (laughs) Kissinger stated that under Obama, American foreign policy has become reactive and passive, though anyone in the tribal lands of northwest Pakistan, in Yemen, Somalia, Iraq and Syria might have a very different view. Drone strikes, which started under the Bush administration, were continued during the Obama years, though so covertly that they barely became a known foreign policy quantity among the average citizen in the U.S., even among the progressive elites. In your view, how reactive and passive was Obama? Boy, that's two big things, reactive and passive. You would imagine that being both of those simultaneously should be an oxymoron, shouldn't you? Yeah, yeah, maybe. (laughs) Okay, well, if, if we say that it's reactive, well, inevitably it's reactive because 
the world learned a critical lesson that it didn't seem to understand. Well, it did understand during the Cold War, and that is you can fight great power by indirect means. So whereas during the Cold War we saw proxy wars Mm. all over the world that were funded by the US and by the Soviet Union, in the main excluding Afghanistan and Vietnam as the obvious examples, Mm. both superpowers avoided having to deal with indirect warfare. Whereas it seems now the only warfare possible is indirect warfare. So inevitably, um, policy now has to be reactive because no one is going to confront you in the way that you want them to because, well, then you'd have the advantage. Now, if this reactive world means that you have to come up with better solutions and, let's be blunt, America hasn't done a very good job of that Hmm. and you keep failing, which they've done pretty monumentally in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan, then there's a certain desire for passivity so you stop looking stupid. So ironically, even though it should be an oxymoron to say that you can be reactive and passive simultaneously... They have been reactive and passive simultaneously, but not in the way that Kissinger, I think, implies, and that is he's implying that somehow they've strayed from the natural cause of America, the natural purpose. Hmm. Whereas what happens is they kept trying to do the natural purpose and cause and discovered that the world has changed. Well, the world has changed. Um, The problem, of course, is that the idea of using proxy methods is, you know, I mean, it's starting to dry up now. I mean, we're, we're starting to see that the great powers are no longer satisfied by just having a, a local minion or a local henchman go about their business for them. Uh, it's more likely that in this new, more dynamic environment that we're going to be seeing, you know, contest state v. state as, as in the bad old days, right? Well, you would figure that we'll have a world now of all possibilities are back on the table. Yeah. Because... There are, thanks to the current arms races around the world, there are more states that have near peers now Mm. that they could have a regional war with knowing that the superpowers either don't care or if they do care, wouldn't be willing to commit. Mm. So it's not a question of the fact that the superpowers have got lax and and, uh, inefficient. It's that quite simply the level of technology available even to small countries now is sophisticated enough that the first few days of hot war will be devastating, yep. immaterial of who the enemy is, and who wants to waste that much kit and that many good people? Mm-hmm. I think that actually Kissinger would agree with a point like that. Uh, I think that uh, when he was trying to imagine what a potential US um, and China's war would be like, uh, he did say that you know with modern technology it would be absolutely devastating. Uh, once once the precision guided munitions run out, um, then we're back to the old kind of conscription slog, aren't we? Mm. Yeah. And, and yet, in an interesting way, we're back to essentially the Cold War style of potential warfare, mm. of either direct uh, conflict between you know powers or the indirect conflict of um, you know insurgencies, or we end up in the sort of the very strange place that I think. Kissinger doesn't want to imagine, Mm. and that is that you can't go to war in that way we did in the 1960s and 1970s and the way the Russians did in Afghanistan in the 1980s Mm. because there is no great cause to fight for. You can try... Well, isn't isn't American exceptionalism a great cause to fight for? I don't know. Is it convincing to Americans anymore? Well, we'll have to wait and see. Donald Trump will probably have a couple of things to say about that soon. But, yeah, the nationalism card is being played in China. It's forever played in the United States to some degree. Mm. But it seems that a lot of the world is beginning to recognise some nationalism for the sense of internal integrity and sense of well-being and purpose, good. But rabid nationalism just leads you into conflict with people and a waste of resources. So, you know, in a sense, American nationalism that goes with exceptionalism is as on the nose in some ways as Chinese exceptionalism and nationalism. And it's a reason why the two of them as the superpowers eyeballing each other both look terrifying and silly. Because the nationalism is sort of... It's not a nationalism that most of the world need anymore. Well, which leads us to the next um, question, really. Uh, 
Kissinger is very supportive of international relations guru Graham Allison. I believe Graham Allison was actually a student of Kissinger's. Mm. That's how old Henry actually is. And how old, and how old Allison is. <laughs> That's right. In uh, Allison's view, America has to be mindful of the Thucydides trap, the idea that um, it's inevitable that a rising power will always come into conflict with an established power. In the contemporary context, of course, we are talking about the, uh, you know, about rising China and the established U.S. Will the People's Republic of China and the U.S. ever really come to terms with each other? I suppose here we could go back into Trump and go, the most likely way he is going to impact on China is if he follows through by putting a 45% tariff on all Chinese goods entering the U.S. Sounds like a disaster to me, but yeah. Well, it sounds like an incredible way to force the Chinese into some sort of response. Now, they can't afford to have the economic fall-off. Their economy is also totally and utterly wedded to the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. The U.S. rely on Chinese money to fund their deficit. Mm -hmm. So is there any way that America and China can get angry at each other and not destroy themselves? If either of them were to blink and do anything crazy... The economic consequences, let alone the military consequences, would be devastating for both countries. In a sense, by the time you potentially had a week of hot war between them, how much economic damage would have already been done that will last decades in the implications for economic growth for China and the United States' ability to live off other people's money, which they've essentially been doing now since the mid-70s. It seems to me China's got the whip hand here in that they make the cheap goods and they provide the money. And that gives them more flexibility, I would imagine, than the Americans. To a point, it does. Um, But, you know, we have to understand that there are some geographical imperatives with regard to China and the distribution of wealth on the Chinese mainland. It is far, far more vulnerable to American action, whatever that action happens to be, whether it's economic or whether it happens to be, you know, military or, or both. Um, China is not a monolithic country. We tend to view China as 1.3 billion people of upwardly mobile, middle class aspirants, basically. And that's not the case at all. Um, you have maybe 400 million people on the um, eastern seaboard of China. Um, that are very wealthy and are doing very well for themselves. And the vast majority of the Chinese people are still uh, eking out a third world existence uh, in the hinterland. Because the wealth has been so unevenly distributed, does that not make China far more vulnerable to potential American pressure? Or does it mean they're both in the same difficult situation? That they've got a massive... America has more redundancy, though. Yeah. yeah again, th- that being the key difference, that American can muddle along... Mm with an angry working class who've lost their jobs. Yes. But the American working class have already been without their jobs for over 20 years. Some people in the Rust Belt saw the beginning of decline under Reagan in the early 80s. That is true. So to what extent um, has the United States elite burned the pot of gold to keep the cosmopolitan dream going when in reality the Rust Belt was you know, creeping further and, and deeper? Mm. So... China might be in more danger because they don't have the reserves, but dynamism and action are still a part of Chinese daily behaviour. From Cold War-style tension emerging over the South China Sea, can China find its place in an American-based international order, or will this order have to be overturned to make room for China? I know it's sort of like a related question to the one before, but it gets down to the heart of whether or not there can be a I don't know, a Sino-American condominium to rule the world, or whether or not these two powers are just destined to, to, to lock horns? I suppose the interesting thing there is, do we have to have a world in which America does look out and engages with everyone? You know, Trump is essentially, it seems from the pronouncement so far, and again, you know, there won't be any action until January, and even then, how much action will he be able to take even with the Republicans controlling Congress, mm. how willing are they going to be to fund anything he wants to do? Yeah. His interests are essentially home interests. Yes, he certainly, it seems, very concerned for the well-being of Israel, mm. but it seems at the moment that his awareness of the world stretches to don't like Mexico, like Israel. That seems to be about his sum total of interest. If we think back to the campaign, 
the one trip he did abroad was to go visit one of his own golf courses in Scotland. Yeah. Is he aware there is an external world beyond golf courses he owns? So how interested is he? And how relevant is it to the proportion of Americans who voted for him who simply want better lives? And the idea, you know, Kissinger was interesting in the article because Kissinger, really, he spent a life believing the same thing, that the US is destined both to have a positive impact in the world, but as a prize for that, to be able to exploit and extract whatever it deems to be in its national interest. Like imperialism. Yeah. Yeah. So Henry is essentially the most elegant, heavily accented case for, we'll do one nice thing over here and we'll rip you off over here, but it's okay because we're the United States. Yeah. Well, that made Henry ugly when he worked for Nixon and it still makes Henry ugly today. Come on, if you know, listeners, if you read the interview, you'll realise that Kissinger is trying to butter up the 19-year-old girls at the table. And at 93, that's saying something. Yeah, it's either sheer bloody desperation <laughs> or senility. I'm not quite sure which. Well, anyway, uh, Mr. Kissinger believes that the world is in chaos, David, um, that there are multiple simultaneous upheavals governed by disparate principles. What does the US have in its playbook to reassert itself over this fracturing international environment? At least I can say I agree on agree with Henry on one point. Uh, what's that? Chaos. Yeah. Okay. But I would argue that Henry is no path to getting out of chaos. Well, he yeah, I'm taking uh, taking a leaf out of his Cambodia uh, exercise. I think uh, the bomb them bomb them to hell, right? Well, his argument for bomb them bomb them to hell was, well, we've tried bombing Hanoi and nothing worked. Yeah, so we'll, buy, we'll, we'll bomb, bomb Cambodia there. instead. That's right. It's closer to, well, it's where the troops that are crossing the border are coming from. So we'll bomb something that we directly know is a genuine tactical target, mm-hmm. which in some ways was an improvement. Well, it was, yes. Instead of going from the political target that wasn't working, they actually went to a tactical target that did have an impact yeah. and did for a while reduce the American body count. But the Americans still lost the Vietnam War. Yeah, because there was a lack of commitment to pre- prosecute it to the level that would have been required to win and what would have been the value of winning at that price. So this is something Kissinger doesn't seem to get. Mm. The war he was most closely involved in was lost because there was no good reason to fight it to win. Mm. And throughout the interview, he seems unable to recognise, is there any point in fighting most of the current conflicts to win? Now, on to Trump specifically. Kissinger believes that this new political era in Washington could establish coherence between US foreign policy and its domestic situation. Don't ask me how, but anyway, that's what he says. Does Kissinger give the idea of a Trump presidency too much credit, David? I think we're giving Kissinger too much credit on having something worthwhile to say about anybody. Put it this way. They've got internal policy that says, isn't life groovy as long as you live in a city where everything's okay, even though your child who has a $50,000 degree, is working at Starbucks three days a week because it's the only job they can get. If that's where America's at, sorry, that's big problems. Yeah. How do you reconcile that with a world that says, we're not going to fight you on the battlefield, but if you come and mess with us one more time and try and make you like us, we'll set up a car bomb. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is a world where the two things can be reconciled other than through, potentially, isolationism. Do you think it's going to be a case of uh, Bill Clinton, it's the economy, stupid redux at some point under Trump? Yeah, but Bill didn't understand the economy because he was a Democrat who wanted to spend money to essentially make his own variant of utopia. Yeah. So it's the economy, stupid, was code for uh, I need money to change the medical system and to change healthcare policy. Mm. Whereas this genuinely is, it's the economy, stupid. Mm. Because it's someone who makes money out of speculation on real estate. And, by all accounts, the new Mexican wall. Or should I say fence? Because there will be some fencing. There'll be fences and walls and perhaps ditches and (laughs) maybe a moat. (laughs) We might even have a castle with a drawbridge. It might do. Could be very exciting. What about a dragon? We can hang a piñata out the front. Oh, lovely. I'm sure the Mexicans would really appreciate that one. So... Kissinger also thinks that the world should stop debating and questioning Trump and move on to allow him to create his philosophy. What if his philosophy is too radical a departure from what traditionalist Republicans or progressive Democrats hold true at a bipartisan level? Then they've only got him for four years, and they better use those four years 
to reform their parties so that in future they can stop someone like him getting power ever, mm. but on the basis that they've done nothing genuinely creative or new or transformative in since Carter in the 70s, mm. I don't think that's very likely that they would reform in a positive way. Yep. So what we can assume is if Trump freaks them out enough, they will reform their parties in a way that they guarantee the only people that can be in office is people approved of by parties, and they will sustain the status quo towards entropy for as long as the system can last. Yeah, that makes sense. So I'd rather have Trump now being a bit crazy on the basis that maybe it gives both chan- parties a chance to reform, mm. but no one can guarantee that the reform will be at all positive. It yeah. could be reform to sustain... Well, let, let's look at it this way. We can essentially say at the moment that the Democratic Party couldn't see what was coming and the amazing footage on the election night of the Hillary event in New York where the Democrats were just walking around looking shell-shocked mm. or sitting on the floor hugging each other because mm. they genuinely could not comprehend that the lovely cosmopolitan world they imagine doesn't actually exist mm. outside of centres of cities. Mm-hmm. Hello? On the other side, we have the Republicans who have spent so long being at the beck and call of the military-industrial complex and big business that the only question is, do our corporate bosses who pay for us really want that? Mm. Which means they are essentially Muppets. So we can either have the clueless left or the Muppet right at present. That's not a great choice. Kissinger doesn't believe Trump is an apologist for Putin. Personally, I agree to a point because while there may seem many superficial things that to the untrained eye can appear Trump being soft on Putin, if Trump is an American nationalist, there will be many points of disagreement between these two leaders as events unfold. What are your thoughts? We've talked about this before, the idea that there is an authoritarian pragmatism growing in the world. Yep. And I think authoritarian pragmatists like the fact they can see other people to go, look, I'm not the only one. But that's only good until they decide, you know, if there's only limited resources or limited opportunities or points of difference. So I don't think there's any problem if personally Trump thinks Putin is an okay kind of leader and vice versa. The reality is the differences between the nations they lead and their fixations on making their states strong and appearing to be powerful and important means they will inevitably have friction. You know, Kissinger's right on this. Mm-hmm. There will inevitably be, be friction between Russia and the United States because quite simply there's enough places where they are on opposite sides of the issue or the geography yeah. with eyeballs and weapons on. Mm-hmm. Kissinger believes that international foreign policy will be in a period of suspension for about six to nine months quite possibly recovering from the, from the shock of the Trump victory. Will this, state, will this state-on-state foreign policy vacuum give space for non-state actors, such as terrorist groups, more room to manoeuvre to provoke America and the world into action? Why does Henry think we're about to get this phase of nothingness? What have we been in for the last eight years? Oh, Obama leadership. Isn't that a form of vacuum? (laughs) Now you're just being nasty. No, I mean, really, the the, the state of suspension, I suppose, he's referring to is the fact that, you know, everyone's running around and trying to figure out what President Trump will actually do um, as of uh, the 20th of January. I mean, what is his main foreign policy cue? And because he's so difficult to read, um, I can imagine here in Australia, for instance, the, the mob and deep fat will be... Uh, buried in their books and running around from computer terminal to computer terminal, hoping that there will be some sort of answer, uh, especially with regard to how a Trump presidency will treat Australia under under his new order. I think it's too polite to say that we're desperately concerned to work out Trump, but other than that, we've all been busy. The mm. reality is none of us have worked out what to do about Syria None of us have worked out how to stop Afghanistan slide into greater turmoil. No one's stopped China's influence in Africa. No one's stopped China's growing influence in South America. No one's stopped Europe going around in ever-diminishing circles. No one's worked out exactly where Putin's point of stopping 
you know, on prodding the West is. The idea that Trump is somehow an important and critically new thing to make sense of. How are we going to make sense of a person where we don't have a history of them in politics when we can't make sense of long-term international events that every supposed expert has been endeavouring to explain? But, but while all this head-scratching is taking place, you know, the, the bad guys among the non-state actors, among the, you know, the al-Qaeda's of the world, the Islamic states of the world, I mean, they'll be rubbing their hands with glee because they will know that there's going to be some form of systemic paralysis among most Western capitals as to what to, how to handle America, how to how, how to man, manage this new this new phenomenon that is Donald Trump. Uh, in in that sort of state of vacuum, obviously there will be um, you know points uh, points of attack that they they must be looking forward to exploit. Look, now would be the time you would think to activate a few cells. Yeah, one to do something in this last period of Obama where he can't really do anything about it. Yep, and one in an early Trump period just to go no no. Mm. Yeah, exactly. But then with them being pushed out of, well, appearing to be pushed out of parts of Raqqa and Mosul, mm. and Mosul's taking a long time. Yeah, it is taking a there while. There was a day this week where I think I read it were 20 suicide attacks on Iraqi forces in one day. Mm, mm, mm. That's huge. Well, That's a slow up. As we said in our last podcast, Just, you know, it's it's going to be a case of them creating the, mm. the jihadist... Um, legend uh, that last yeah. stand yeah. that last great battle the mother of all battles Battles. if you will yeah and sending all the westerners home yeah. so realistically is it likely the cells will light up at some point soon after trump takes power yes mm. is it because trump's in power no those cells were going to go home and wait somewhere in the west anyway and i don't think it would have mattered if it was clinton or trump I actually do agree with you there. I think that yeah. even Test under the president, yeah, they, they would, they, they, any president would have been tested under these circumstances. I mean, even take those two candidates out and yeah. have a third candidate. Anyway, finally, the Iran nuclear deal. If I were in the inner circle of the Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, I might be slightly concerned that Trump may rescind America's participation in the P5 plus 1 accord and allow the Israelis a free hand to bomb Iran's nuclear facilities. What do you reckon? I think this is the only thing where you, me and Henry are all going to agree. Mm. I think Iran is the only one where Henry's analysis seems to have something to do with reality rather than 1946. Yeah, I think uh, I think you're right. I think that um, there is certainly a, a very large group of Republicans who are very sceptical um, of the um, P5 plus 1 accord. Uh, I also think that Iran's behavior over recent months have demonstrated that for them, the nuclear card was a card to be played in a game of poker with the United States. They were quite happy to strike any kind of agreement so long as their overall strategic big picture policy plans were not going to be rolled back because Iran thinks like an imperial power. The the Iranian armed forces are backing the Syrian government as we speak with the Russians in Syria. Mm. Uh, The Iranian government is backing Houthi rebels in Yemen. The Iranians are stirring up trouble in Bahrain. Mm. They do have expansive ambitions. And I mean, with Bahrain being the headquarters of the American Fifth Fleet, uh, that's a problem for the United States. Uh, the fact that Houthi rebels apparently shot out at U.S. Uh, warships um, patrolling the Arabian Sea shows a level of aggressiveness that the Iranians are prepared to put on the table now because they seem to be unhindered by their actions. You know, the nuclear thing was almost like a millstone around their neck. When they gave the Americans the idea that they would go to the table and, and, and discuss this in good faith, they were able to just ratchet up conventional guerrilla style slash terrorist style attacks on on US um, interests throughout the Middle East and elsewhere. So I I think that here we have a a significant issue. The Americans would not want to, I don't even think that they could afford to bomb a country the size of Iran, but to basically say to the Israelis, well, you know, um, they also back um, Shia um, Southern Lebanese group Hezbollah. You've always hated these guys. Why don't you just have a free hand and go off and do your damage and we'll support you from afar. That sounds like a, a very real prospect. Mm. And I think this is perhaps the single aspect where Putin and Trump might first realise they can't appreciate each other's pragmatic authoritarianism. That Russia is finding more and more ways to try and deal with Iran on a regular basis. And that I think this will be the point that will actually divide the Americans and the Russians first. Yeah, you know, Syria is just a mess. 
but what happens in Iran next determines what Israel will do next. Yeah. Determines how this flows on into the rest of the region and how more than likely things get even worse. Yeah, they knock out Iran. It's going to have huge implications for uh, whether or not Assad actually holds on in Syria. Um, and then it will also have huge implications for Yemen and how the Houthis manage to hang on as well. Because Iran is such a huge... It's just a massive player in the Middle East. Yeah. It's interesting when you reflect upon the fact that the Iranians have been under international sanctions basically since the 1979 revolution. And in spite of those sanctions, they created a functional state. And not only a functional state, a state that could still expand its influence mm. to areas where you kind of thought, well, hang on a tick, how can a country move into these areas when they're effectively being sanctioned by every major power? But they managed to create their own defense industrial base. Mm. They managed to train their own forces. They had that sort of imperial instinct, which is so Persian. Mm. Um, and you, you know, in spite of the fact that at this period of history they're covered by the Shiite theocracy, it's really a mask because the mask, the the mask basically just covers up the fact that they're Persian imperial mm. there's, chauvinists. There's Persian imperialism below it. Yeah, and there's an awful lot of Russian imperialism and Persian imperialism mm. that can find common ground. Yeah, and really, in some ways, if the United States gives Israel any kind of free reign on this. Mm the only outcome is disastrous for everybody. What well, do you think that the Israelis would use nuclear weapons? I don't think it matters if they do or don't. I think the fact that they would strike Iran, I can't conceive how Iran could not respond. And even if it can't respond directly, hmm. it's getting so good at indirectly white-anting its neighbours, its rivals, its near peers, yeah. that... If this gets push after push after push after push, eventually Israel maybe has to go nuclear because Iran is just being so effective at creating havoc. Mm -hmm. I wonder how the Saudis are going to be viewing this. Ultimately, they would, be the, they would stand to be the, the immediate beneficiaries if Iran could be knocked back on its heels. But they seem to be very good at squandering any opportunity that comes their way. I think the explosion of... The remains of Al-Qaeda out of Yemen back into Saudi Arabia when it comes is going to mean they're going to be so busy cleaning up their own backyard mm -hmm. that I think big picture issues will be secondary to survival. And I genuinely think that if things get worse in the region, you know, it's genuinely existential threat time for Saudi Arabia. Yeah, interesting times indeed. Well, anyway, thanks for listening to this episode. We hope that you'll join us for our next exciting adventure through the world of geopolitics. Remember that you can subscribe to Strategicon through iTunes and SoundCloud. And please like us on the Sage International Australia Facebook site and follow us on Twitter. We're always looking to pass on the most interesting information on international relations and security to our social media followers. And until next time, it's goodbye from me, John Bruni. And goodbye from me, David Olney.